one verse as an opening scripture in my title, and I'll let you be seated. If you've got your Bible, John chapter 11, verse 18. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. John chapter 11, verse 18. says this in the New Living Translation. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. It's not a long scripture, but I want to elaborate on this tonight. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. My title tonight is this. It's the wayward. Everybody say the wayward. And the hungry. Somebody say the hungry. Amen. Before we jump any further into the scripture, why don't you lift your hands one more time? There is a witness of the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. And I'm just praying that tonight would just be an overflow of what we experienced this weekend. So would you just lift your voice and just say, God, in my life, like we just sang about, God, would you be lifted high in this place tonight? Lord Jesus, we're gathered here together under the banner of your name, the name of Jesus. And God, we are here on purpose. God, we are here with intention tonight, God, to leave changed. God, to receive revelation through the power of your word. God, I'm not here on Wednesday night just to have another Wednesday night service because it's on the schedule. But God, I am here to meet with you and to be changed by the power of your word. Why don't you lift your voice, young people? That's all right. <laughs> Clapping's good too, but I pray that you would just lift your voice and say, Jesus, have your way in this place tonight. God, let your kingdom come. God, let your will be done. Amen. I feel a witness of the Holy Ghost as we sang that last song. The wayward. Everybody say the wayward. In the hungry. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and you may be seated. I'm going to try my best. I'm accustomed to teaching, but I'm going to try my best to preach tonight. So I pray that you would, when the word goes forth and you would agree, you would say, Amen. let's try that again. If you're going to agree with the word tonight, you're going to say, Amen. Amen. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And John chapter 11 is my opening text tonight, but this is not where I'm basing the majority of my message out of. But this gives us a context for everything that we're about to go through tonight. Bethany. Bethany was a small village just a short distance from Jerusalem. And Bethany is the place in the scripture where we read that Mary, she broke that alab the alabaster box and washed the feet of Jesus. Bethany is also the place where Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. And to this day, Bethany is called the place of Lazarus because of this instant in human history. But more importantly than all these things that happened, and they are great, and they are powerful miracles and, and uh, allusions in the Bible, but more importantly, this is where Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection in Luke chapter 24, verse 50. Bethany is the place that Jesus spoke his final words before leaving earth and commissioning those that were there that day to go to the upper room that we read about in the book of Acts and wait for the promise of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, and then jumping to verse 15, it says this, The former treaties have I made to thee, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but they should wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And if you're glad for the Holy Ghost, would somebody say amen? amen. And in those days... Skipping down to verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, and the number and names of together were about 120 people. Everybody say 120. Now, these 120 people that we read about in Scripture are popularly known and renowned as the ones who were there 
in the book of Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost was poured out for the first time. And these are the 120 people who were all in one accord and in one place with one purpose. These are the 120 that in one day had a 3,000 soul revival. And these are the 120 that sold all their possessions and divided them equally amongst themselves. And these are the 120 people who were the pioneers of the apostolic church that we are a part of today. And these are the 120 people who are in the limelight, often causing us to overlook one very small fact that you don't read about in the book of Acts and you don't read about it uh, in this account where Jesus is, is ministering to these people before he ascends into heaven and there's 120 there. There is one detail that in between the lines of Scripture you can miss. That day when Jesus ascended into heaven, there was not 120 people there, but there were actually 500 people who were commissioned by Jesus to go to, go to Jerusalem after his ascension in Bethany. And we, we can read this account in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 6. It says this, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, I'm not reading from the King James Version tonight, of the good news I preached to you before, you welcome it then, you stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe this message. I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I pass on to you what was most important and what had always been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scriptures said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead. And on the third day, just as Scripture said, he was seen by Peter and by the twelve. And after that, everybody say after that. He was seen by more than 500 of his followers. If you're quick at math, if you're past maybe grade five, I don't know. I don't know what they teach in the schools nowadays. But this is some pretty simple math. 500 people were there. 500 people were witness to Jesus after he was raised from the dead on the third day. But Acts chapter 1 only talks about 120 people that make it to the upper room. 380, everybody say 380. This is a number of people, and not just a number of, of random people, don't be mistaken tonight. That is the number of Jesus followers, because that's what the Scriptures tells us. It wasn't just a random multitude. This wasn't just a random conglomeration of people that Jesus ran into along the way in Bethany. These were people who followed after Jesus. For whatever reason, missed out on the outpouring of the Holy Ghost for the very first time in human history. 380 people were too busy. 380 people had something more important to do. 380 people didn't make the trip from Bethany to the upper room in Jerusalem that day. And like I said, please understand the context. These were people that were proclaimed as followers of Jesus. These were people that uh, followed him when he was alive on this earth and saw the miracles that he did and hung out with him and saw him after his resurrection from the dead. The greatest miracle of all time, the reason that today we have this access to salvation, that we can be baptized in Jesus' name because the blood has power now, and the reason that we can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. These 380 people saw Jesus after his resurrection, but somehow they went wayward and they got lost along the way. Everybody say Bethany. 380 people cho chose to stay in Bethany. And as I was studying for tonight, this really hit me smack dab in the face as I was studying and, and, and looking this up. It came to me. I, I said, you know, what, what, does, what does Bethany mean? So I started looking into it. 
And uh, happened to run across some of Pastor Woodward's notes from a, a previous sermon years and years and years ago. But Bethany means the house of unripe figs or house of misery because of its lonely location facing away from the city. Bethany in the scripture represents unfulfilled potential. This is what the word Bethany means, unfulfilled potential. And how appropriate is it and how eye-opening is it? Please understand with me for a minute. How eye-opening is it that 380 people didn't go to the upper room, didn't make the trek a couple miles down the road to Jerusalem. They didn't leave Bethany, and they missed out on one of the most critical moments in history, the birth of the church to stay in Bethany, to stay in a place of unfulfilled potential. Three hundred and eighty stayed in a place that literally means unfulfilled potential. And I want you to understand this point tonight that you can follow Jesus your entire life and you can call yourself a Christian, but you can live a life of unfulfilled potential. That's a pretty weak amen. If you agree with the word tonight, say amen. Amen. You can live for God and you can walk with God and you can attend church every Sunday and every Wednesday that the doors are open, but you can live a life of unfulfilled potential. And I don't know about you tonight, but I know that in my life, I refuse to be a part of a Bethany church. I refuse to be a part of a Bethany youth group. And there is so much potential in the room tonight. Can you understand with me? Look around. Look who's sitting beside you, and they maybe don't look like a whole lot to you, but you have absolutely no idea in the spirit who is sitting beside you. And I refuse to be a part of a church, and I refuse to be a part of a youth group that sits in unfulfilled potential. You have to understand tonight that the devil is so scared of the potential that sits in this room tonight. He's terrified of what you can do for the kingdom of God. You might say, well, I'm only 12, I'm only 15. Age really doesn't matter because David was called to be king. He was anointed king of Israel at such a young age, and it didn't happen for years to come, but he fulfilled the potential that God had in store for him. But there are missionaries in the room tonight. I believe it in Jesus' name. I believe there's pastors in the room tonight. You might not hear the voice of God calling yet in your life, but I believe there are missionaries. I pray and I believe that there are pastors. I pray and I believe that there are evangelists in the room tonight. And he will do anything and everything, the devil, to shut you down from reaching your potential in Jesus. I want to take a moment right here. Everybody just lift your hands in the room and just just pray to God for a minute. God, if you can use anybody, you can use me. This isn't part of my notes tonight, but I believe there's some untapped potential in the room tonight. I want you to understand that you're part of a church and a youth group, and you've got a youth team, and you've got pastors that believe in you, that you can do something for the kingdom of God. Put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder for a minute. Just pray for them in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would use our young men. God, I pray that you would use our young women tonight. God, I pray that you would bestow a calling greater than what is in my life, greater than what is in Brother Woodward's life, and greater than what is in Pastor Matt's life tonight. Lord Jesus, would you anoint our young men to preach the word? Lord, would you anoint our young men to reach out to our community and reach out to our city? Jesus, would you anoint our young men and our young women, God, to preach your gospel around the world? God, there's so much potential in the room tonight. That's all right, young people. It's a little unorthodox, but you can lift up your voice right now. Just cry out to God, God, I want to be used by you. I refuse to live in my unfulfilled potential. If you're hungry for God to use you, I dare you to stand to your feet tonight and raise your hands and just say, God, if you can use anybody, 
you can use me. God, I volunteer. God, I want to be useful at you. God, I want to do exploits for your kingdom. That's all right, young people. Just lift up your voice. God, we worship you tonight. We refuse to be a Bethany youth group. God, we refuse to be a Bethany church. God, we want to be the movers and the shakers of this world. God, we want to make an impact on our city. God, we want to make an impact on our district. Jesus, I prophesy in the room tonight that there are missionaries that are going to go to Asia. God, there are missionaries that will reach to the, to the continent of Africa and Europe and South America in this room tonight, God. There are evangelists that will preach the best sermons that have ever been preached yet. God, there are evangelists that will preach to congregations of thousands. God, there are church planters in the room tonight. Jesus, God, we refuse to live in unfulfilled potential. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Samson is the perfect story of an unfulfilled life, unfulfilled potential. It's in Judges chapter 16 that we find his story. And we won't go through all the scripture tonight, but I will paraphrase what happened to the life of Samson. If you've been around a while, you've heard it before. And, and maybe if you haven't been around a while, if this is your first time tonight, you may have heard about Samson in history. But they lay it all out for us. When Samson fell for Delilah, a woman from the valley of Sorek, it marked the beginning of his downfall and his eventual demise. It didn't take long for the rich and powerful Philistine rulers to learn of the affair and immediately pay a visit to Delilah. Hoping to capture Samson, the Philistine leaders each offered Delilah a sum of money to collaborate with them in a scheme to uncover the secret of Samson's great strength. Using her powers of seduction and deception, Delilah persistently wore down Samson with her repeated requests until he finally divulged the crucial information. Having taken the Nazarite vow of birth, Samson had been set apart to God, and as a part of that vow, his hair has never, had never been cut to date. But when Samson told Delilah that his strength would leave him if a razor were to be used on his head, she cunningly crafted her plan with the Philistine rulers while Samson slept on her lap. While Samson slept on her lap, Delilah called in a, a co-conspirator to shave off the seven braids of his hair. Subdued and weak, Samson was captured. But rather than just killing him, the Philistines preferred to humiliate him by gouging out his eyes and subjecting him to hard labor in the Gaza prison. He slaved at a grinding grain. His hair began to grow, but the careless Philistines paid no attention. In spite of the horrible failures and his sins of great consequence, Samson's heart now turned to the Lord. He was humbled, and for the first time, Samson called out to God, and God answered. During a pagan sacrificial ritual, the Philistines had gathered together in Gaza to celebrate. As was their custom, they paraded their prized enemy prisoner into the temple to entertain the jeering crowd. Samson braced himself between the two central support pillars of the temple and pushed it with all of his might. Down came the temple, killing Samson and all of the people in it. And though through his death, Samson destroyed more of his enemies in one sacrificial act than he had previously killed in all the battles of his life. Everybody say Samson. Without going into too much detail tonight, Samson, he threw it all away, okay? Please understand. Samson had a, a vow and he had a pact with God and Samson had amazing strength, superhuman strength that he was endued with from God because of the vow that he kept, which included never cutting his hair, never putting a razor to his head. And he had every, everything that he had worked for, everything that he had been taught and raised in, and everything that he knew to be true, he proved over and over again by victory after victory that God was on his side. Talk about miracles. Samson saw miraculous things happen and went up against his hundreds and his thousands single-handedly and won. 
He knew that God was on his side. He was used by God to slay hundreds of Israel's enemies. He knew that uh, what it, he knew what it was to be used by God, but he threw it all away in an act of lust. Be careful, young people, what you allow to enter into your life and what you entertain yourself with. And we hear this all the time, but Samson is such a great story of somebody who, in a moment of weakness, in a moment of lust, temptation, he sees Delilah, he desires her. In this moment, this was the very moment that he began to, to, as we read at the beginning, he began to fall into sin, and he lost everything that he had. Samson had a calling in his life since the day he was born. Samson's calling from birth was, was to begin the deliverance of Israel from Philistine oppression. Judges chapter 13, verse 1 to 5 says this, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines forty years and there was a certain man of Zorah, the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. We talk about Samson a lot. Maybe a couple times a year you hear somebody talk about Samson. But oftentimes I think we overlook the fact that Samson wasn't just empowered by God to be empowered by God. Samson didn't just have a Nazarite vow and was super strong just so he could kill hundreds and thousands of, of Israel's enemies. That's not what it was all about. Samson had a calling on his life to begin the de to deliver Israel out of the hand of their enemies. We're talking about delivering a nation out of persecution and slavery and bondage. That was the calling of Samson, and he knew it. It was no mystery to him, and he threw it all away in a moment of weakness and threw away all the potential that he had and basically put a whole nation under bondage because of what he did and his actions and his re repercussions didn't only affect him and his family, but it affected the whole nation of Israel because he was supposed to be their deliverer and begin the delivery out of the hands of the Philistines. Unfulfilled potential. Samson died that day, and he did kill thousands. But there was so much more that Samson could have done had he not fallen into sin. Another place in the Bible that we can look at tonight, and I'm going to come quickly to a close, the church of the Laodiceans. Unfulfilled potential at its finest. Happy with halfway. Happy to follow God, happy to be a part of the church. Please understand, these were people that were part of the church of the Laodiceans. Happy to go to church, happy to be halfway. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 to 20. I'm going to read from the New International Version. It says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. We come back to the music tonight. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and don't need a thing, but you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. What God is saying here in the book of Revelation to the angel that is speaking to the church, he's saying, you think that you have it all. You think that you have something of importance. You've got gold. You have wealth of this world. But what you don't understand is you are sacrificing the wealth of a world to come. 
You are sacrificing the wealth of heaven for the wealth on earth. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me as we stand tonight. And I know we prayed a couple of minutes ago and and, and we will pray again. Unfulfilled potential. No doubt when you get to heaven, there's going to be people there who are part of the church of the Laodiceans. They live for God. They prayed a little bit. They worship. They would run the aisles on Sunday when the evangelist was in town. They would amen the preacher on Sunday night. But when they left that place, they lived a life of lukewarm. They weren't on fire for God. Maybe they were on Sunday. Maybe they were on Wednesday night. Maybe they were after a Saturday night prayer meeting. Maybe they were on fire after youth convention. But as Monday came, as Tuesday came, their walk with God dwindled and dwindled. And those people will make it to heaven. But they wasted their whole life being confused and being so bound up in temporal things. Leaving so much on the table that God wanted to use them for. And they passed up on it all. Why don't you just close your eyes with me for a minute? If you want God to use you, I pray that in this moment you would just lift your hands. Nobody looking around. But if you sincerely want God to use you, I pray that you would just begin to pray. And I'm going to finish up here as you pray. But please understand that Bethany was just a few miles away from Jerusalem. It doesn't take very long to get off course, young people. Bethany was just a few miles down the road. It was just a quick walk to go to the upper room. It wouldn't have taken them all day. It would have taken them half an hour to get there. But they refused to go because they were too busy to be used by God. And they were too busy and they missed out on the outpouring of the Holy Ghost for the very first time. That's it. Let's just lift that up for a minute. God, I'm I'm tired of jumping on Sunday, but God, not not living for you on Monday. God, I'm tired of running the aisles on Sunday, but not praying on Monday. God, I'm tired of amening the preacher and agreeing with the word on Sunday, but not reading my Bible on Monday and Tuesday. A hand clap is good, but I pray that you would right now in in this moment just lift your voice. Your voice has so much power than a hand clap. If you want to be used by God and if you want to be the revolution in this church and in this world, I pray that you would just come up to the front right now. When you get here, just throw up your hands and say, God, I want to be used by you. God, it's not enough for li- to live for you on a Sunday and on a Wednesday, but God, I need to live with you every day. I don't want to be part of a Bethany church, and God, I don't want to be part of a Bethany youth group, and God, I don't want to get so tangled up in the things of this world. God, I don't want to get so tangled up in sin that I live a life of unfulfilled potential. Maybe for you in this moment, this is a good time to pray a prayer of repentance. I'm calling you tonight to be a part of the 120. 380 stayed behind, but 120 were hungry enough and said, God, God, I need your spirit. God, I need your promise in my life. I can't do this 
on my own. Would you just express your hunger to God in this moment? God, I'm so hungry to see a revival in this youth group. God, I'm so hungry to see a revival in my school. God, I'm so hungry to see a revival in my family. But God is asking, how bad do you want it tonight? How bad do you want to see that backslidden family member come back? How bad do you want to see your P7 club so big that you have to sit in the gymnasium to have everybody get there? Would you just let your hunger out tonight? How bad do you want to be used by God tonight? Lord Jesus, I refuse to live a life of unfulfilled potential. Lord, I refuse to live a life bound up in sin and bound up in everything that is so temporal. Come on, young people, that's all right. Just lift your hands and let your hunger out. Just tell God how bad you want to be used. God, I pray that there are young people in this room tonight that you would use in the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that there are young people tonight that you would use in the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, we need the gifts of the Spirit in operation in our youth group. God, we need the gifts of the Spirit in operation in our young people. Lord, I pray that in this moment, God, I pray that in this moment, some young person would feel a calling to ministry for the very first time. God, that you would plant a seed even in this moment. God, I don't care how young they are. God, you could plant a seed in this moment for a missionary. God, you could plant a seed in this moment for a youth pastor. God, you could plant a seed in somebody's life to be the next great evangelist that goes around the world preaching your gospel. wish somebody would pray like it was Sunday night at youth convention. Just shut yourself in for a minute. This is pretty good for a Wednesday night, but I wish you would just push a little bit more. God, I need to be used by you. God, I desire it so strongly. God, I want to do something for your kingdom. God, I don't want to just live my life and go to school and get a job. God, I don't want to just have a family and attend church and live a good life, but never actually do anything for your kingdom. God, I refuse to be part of a Bethany church. I lift up your name, Jesus. 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 God, I just don't want to just go Sunday to Sunday anymore or Sunday to Wednesday without talking to you. God, I don't want to hear about other churches' revivals but miss out on one right here. God, I thank you for what you're doing on foreign fields, but God, would you pour out your spirit here? Jesus in your name. Jesus in your name. Jesus in your name. Before we go tonight, can you just find somebody to pray with? Lay your hand on their shoulder. Just pray over them like you would want them to pray over you. Can you do that? Let's pray an anointing from corner to corner life to life, vessel to vessel. But let's not forget, let's to lift up our voice. Call in the name of the Lord tonight. 
Thank you, Jesus, for your word tonight. Thank you for a clear word, a clear call. I pray that we would respond to it in faith, God. I pray that we would respond to it in our action. Lord Jesus, as the leader of this department and the pastor over these young people, God, I see it, the potential. I see the, the heights that they could rise to. God, I pray right now that you would keep them from temptation and deliver them from evil, God, and preserve them on this path of life to fulfill your purpose. God, give them a determination. God, come what may in their life, they're going to serve you. They're going to follow you. They're going to pursue the things of God. They're going to seek you in prayer. God, they're going to realize your purpose in their life to deliver people in their generation, to serve their generation. God, what a privilege it is to be in your presence right now. God, we love you. We worship you tonight. Give another 90 seconds in prayer if you would. Just, just push one more time and lift your voice. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. I want to say that strikes me in the story is that Jesus spoke to the 500 on a mountain. I don't know if he said that or not. I don't think he did, but it was on a mountaintop. And you recognize in the scripture even that it's easy. You know, people like to come to the mountaintop experiences and be a part of those. But sometimes the in the trenches, the nitty-gritty of living for God. Evidently, it's a little bit more difficult to, you know, go to a prayer meeting. A little less popular. The crowd seems to dwindle a little bit, right? I think that's obvious and evident. But God did not need the majority to start the church that has lasted through the ages. We're still here to this day, 2,000 years later. He didn't start with the majority. And he still doesn't need a majority. We would love it if everybody got on board. But we don't need a majority. I think sometimes we wait to see what somebody else is going to do before we step out in faith and we act. Thank God that the 120 weren't like that. You know, if, if it was us, I, would, I hate to say it, but if it was us, we'd probably be like, well, not everyone's here. Let's play football. Right? We, we don't need everybody to get on board. You don't need your best friend that you sit beside in church to get on board and to start praying and seeking God in order for you with everything that you've got, with all your heart, soul, and passion and strength to begin praying and seeking God. God has never needed a majority. He still does not need a majority. But if he can just get a select few, a handful of people, just a remnant of his followers to take him seriously and to seek him and pray and fast and, and to give their very lives to him, he can do something with those people. He can do something with those people. It's easy on the mountaintop, like last weekend, like youth convention. It's kind of cliche and, and whatever, but it's the truth that it's easy in those times to to, to Jericho. You know, I, I joined in on the Jericho. I'm, I'm guilty of Jerichoing on the mountaintop and, and 
not so much here, right? <laughs> Literally. It's easy to, to shout and to clap and to respond on the mountaintop experiences, but, but if we can just get a handful of people to get a hold of this word, we are in such proximity of being in the will of God and in just, man, it's, it, that scripture, I never realized that. Bethany, it was so close to Jerusalem, so close to fulfilling the purpose and potential. Powerful word from God. I hope you, I hope you let it get in your heart tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Can we pray one more time before we go tonight? God, we thank you for your word. What a powerful, anointed, direction-setting word for this youth group. As we head into the summer months, God, school is coming to a close, and, and there's so much potential in the next few months as we have some more free time. And God, I believe you're calling a young person to not just fritter it away and waste their time this summer and in the months and years to come, but God, you're calling them to realize the potential that you've given to them, to to take full advantage of the calling that you've placed upon their lives to do something powerful for the kingdom. God, to be a deliverer in their generation, to be somebody that proclaims truth in the midst of error and all kinds of foolishness. God, you've called them, and you want to put your hand upon them. And I pray, Jesus, that we would be a Jerusalem kind of church, not a Bethany kind of church, a people that pursue the call and the word from God. Go tarry in Jerusalem and not just go back to Bethany. God, thank you for what you've spoken. Let it take root. Let it bear fruit. Let us be doers and not just hearers of the word. We pray in Jesus' name. So we say in Jesus' name. And if you'd help me close this service with one big, long, resounding praise unto God. Hallelujah. Can somebody say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus.